The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are those of the individual co-host and do not reflect the official policy or position of the Firearms Radio Network and or their employers. Viewer discretion is advised. This is especially true on our live shows. Broadcast for shooters, hunters, and gun enthusiasts, this is the Firearms Radio Network. The bandwidth for this episode of This Week in Guns is sponsored by Patriot Patch Company. PatriotPatch.co Welcome to This Week in Guns. This show is brought to you by the Firearms Radio Network and Patriot Patch Company. And this show offers commentary on the latest firearms industry news, information, and buzz. I'm your host, Sean Heron. It's my pleasure to introduce our panelists tonight. She is a founder and director of Rally for Our Rights, single mom, advocate for gun rights, our women's rights, and her name is Leslie Hollywood. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Glad to have you here. Uh, you are all over the Firearms Radio Network this this uh, this week, right? Yeah, so I was just on on Monday as well, and then um, realized we were going to be face to face again on Wednesday. So that's pretty cool. <laughs> well, I'm sorry about that. Uh, you know, <laughs> you probably would have chosen differently <laughs> had you realized. <laughs> no, no, it's great. I'm excited to be on. I love it. All right, we're going to get right into the news at the end. I'll give you a chance to talk about all the stuff you've been up to. Uh, but before we do, I just want to recommend that our listeners go check out the Patriot Patch Company. PatriotPatch.co, Patch of the Month Club, is amazing. In our top stories tonight, we have Oklahoma constitutional carry will be legal November 1st. I am pretty excited about this whenever I kind of see constitutional carry go through. I think well, certainly a, this was a uh, campaign promise well, for uh, Governor Kevin Stead before he was governor here. And hold on one second. Sorry about that. This- anyway. Constitutional carry, I think, is a is a good thing. I don't think it affects our industry poorly at all. A lot of people say, well, all the firearms instructors and educators, they're going to be out of jobs and things like that. We've talked to a lot of people in constitutional carry states, uh, a guest on this show, Matt DeVito from uh, Downrange Firearms Training, is exactly one of those. He said it didn't affect his business at all, and I think that's great. It is a constitutional right. We should be able to protect ourselves, and this kind of thing is uh, the exact kind of thing that I'm into. Leslie, what are your thoughts here? Um, so I'm actually r- right on board with you on that. I love constitutional carry. Uh, I think it's I, I think it's just incredibly important for many reasons. And I actually I kind of talk about some of the reasons why I think it's so important when people come back at me about concealed carry and people should be trained. At least that requires training. All this important, all this the stuff that they always you know the arguments that they have. I actually see it though as I I, I think that con- a concealed carry actually comes with a level of um, like privilege, for example, it costs money, right? You have to go through this training, you have to go through, which I think training is, is, is very important. But at the same time, you know, I think that, you know, people who are in poverty also have a right to carry firearms. Um, and I think that th- this kind of bridges that gap. It says, hey, you know, instead of going and paying, you know, all this money, you need to get your concealed carry permit, all of this stuff, you can, you can then get that, you put that into training. Um, and so it kind of bridges a gap uh, when it comes to like class. And I think that's really important. The other thing is too, is that I, is, is the age thing. So like my daughter, for example, you know, she's 19 and uh, almost 20 and she can't get her concealed carry permit until she's 21. Now that girl, I'll be honest with you, trains far more than I do. Um, she is just, I mean, she is into her training. She's very serious about it. She's probably more, more trained than a lot of people who conceal carry already, yet she can't conceal carry um, because she's not 21. So constitutional carry opens up doors for people who are otherwise prohibited from doing it for certain, whether it's financial reasons or age, and allows them to have that right to self-defense, which I just think is so important. Yeah, I totally 100% agree. And I want everyone to be trained. I think everyone who has a gun, owns a gun, carries a gun should go through and get as much training as they can possibly afford, but I don't want the government to mandate it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the government is a huge, uh, huge barrier <laughs> to pretty much everything. So exactly. Um, yeah. And, and, instead of putting money into concealed carry permits, let's put it into training. Yeah. 100%. 100% agree. Next story comes to us. Expedited bump stock appeal scheduled for March 13th. This comes to us from the Firearms Policy Coalition. Uh, as we talked about last week on this show, uh, the Fi- Firearms Policy Foundation lawsuit, or they they filed to uh, have an injunction to basically stop the bump stock ban from going into effect until all the court cases uh, were, were followed through to resolution. Uh, the judge came back with a very, very long decision to basically not allow that to happen. Well, then the Firearms Policy Foundation 
filed to have expedited, have an expedited appeal that would basically resolve everything before this goes into effect. The judge granted, granted it. Uh, I think it's a good thing. Leslie, what are your thoughts here? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's unfortunate that the injunction was denied. Uh, that would have been, you know, obviously the the best outcome in this situation. Um, but yeah, I, I agree with this. And I actually, I think FPC actually, or I guess it's the, the foundation that does the actual lawsuits. But I think I think their lawsuit was one of the best ones that got dropped on this this bump stock ban, and um, definitely needs to stay in court. But yeah, I mean, you know, let's push up, let's push that up, and let's get it taken care of because, yeah. Man, I was I was pretty furious when when all that went down. Yeah, me too. And it was really surprising. I had actually talked to Adam Kraut personally um, that day or a couple of days before, actually, and he was expecting it the day I talked to him, but it didn't come through for a couple of days. He said they made a great argument. He said the judge seemed educated and made a lot of or had a lot of really excellent questions, um, and that he was really feeling pretty positive about the injunction being granted. But you know, as things definitely happen. It seems to me that the injunction would be granted almost out of, out of rote just because this is going into effect. It's, you know, taking Americans property without any kind of remuneration or anything like that. Like it's, it's a, it's a really big deal. So I was really shocked to see that it came through, but hopefully we'll see this come through. The expedited appeal is a little bit troublesome in my opinion, because it doesn't give the attorneys on our side enough time to prepare. They are very, very prepared already. They've already basically worked everything out that they're going to say and file and, and do everything else out, you know, in advance of this. But at the same time, it feels like things are, are, are going to be rushed on both sides. And that, that always freaks me out just a little bit. Yeah, definitely. Is it, so is it the DOJ that's fighting this on the other side? You know, probably, uh, I'm not sure All who right. the, the plane, who the, what, what do you call it is the, uh, I don't remember what the word I'm looking for is, but yeah, I don't know who the lawsuit is against exactly. Okay. Yeah. I, I'm pretty sure. I feel like it was the DOJ. I remember going through all of that back when, when the lawsuits were filed and, uh, but anyways, yeah, it's, um, yeah, no, you know, I agree with you. I think that it, it's really important to make sure that everyone's well prepared. But the other thing is too, is that if one side has less time, the other side with mean, the DOJ is already busy enough doing their stuff, are they really going to, how important is this really to them? So maybe rushing it could actually be a benefit. Yeah, totally agree. I'm going to go, I'm going to backtrack just a little bit. A new player has joined. Uh, we just had <laughs> freelance writer, firearms instructor, and passionate 2A advocate Karen Hunter join us. Welcome. Hi, sorry. <laughs> no problem at all. No problem at all. Uh, we're a couple stories in. Uh, next one is White House tells Congress that a veto is likely on gun control bills. Uh, specifically mentioned in this article is the universal background check. And uh, I thought that was kind of interesting. There was the other one, the HR 1112, which would stretch the time allowed for delays on background checks from the current three business days out to 10. President Trump is very confusing to me in a lot of ways. In some ways, I feel like this whole bump stock ban thing is something that his strategists or maybe even himself thought would never see a day in court or never get past court or even the Supreme Court, and that maybe they kind of threw that out to placate some of the people who are anti-gun and demanded these things, knowing that would it would never actually go through. I don't know if that's true or not. I've heard that speculated. But for him to say that he's going to veto these, I mean, clearly that that's what we want. If they do get through, uh, we don't want these terrible pieces of legislation going going in. Karen, what are your thoughts on all this? I think you will. I think that I kind of agree with the bump stock thing. I know some people say that doing anything, even if it's kind of meaningless, is wrong. But I think in his position, it's a, more of a strategy type thing. But I'm a huge Trump supporter, and I'm hoping that that's the way it's going to go. I don't see him doing anything else because a huge part of his support following are mm -hmm. 2A. Yeah, that's what I thought people, too. So. That's what I thought too. So hopefully it's part of a bigger strategy. We'll see if he actually vetoes these. Leslie, what do you think? So, I mean, I would say if there's one thing that Trump does, it's that he says he's going to do things and he does it. He said he was going to do a bump stock ban and no matter the backlash, he did it. Um, I mean, he, he, he sticks to his word. I don't always agree with him on everything. I'm a very policy issues focused person. So I don't really get caught up in the, in the politicians themselves, no matter who they are. But I mean, his record kind of says I'm going to do things and he doesn't care what people think, which is a, a big benefit in a case like this, because the fact is he might just veto them if they were to end up at his desk. And I haven't really looked at the makeup of the Senate. If there are people who are potentially supporting it, 
and how many, as far as the Republicans go, could this actually pass into law? That'd be really interesting to see. But I, you know, I, I would, I have faith that he would actually veto it, to be honest with you, even though he's not necessarily been the best on like the bump stock ban, which I didn't agree with personally. But yeah, I mean, I, I have faith that he will stick to his word because that's what he does, seems to do. Yeah, totally agree. Uh, I think Kenny put this next one in uh, with two female guests just to make me uncomfortable, but the headline is as such. Indiana man could face charges after he castrated himself with a high point. <laughs> so a guy was sent to the hospital. Uh, he was walking. He was on a walkway near a Girl Scout cabin. I'm not sure all the details there. That's all the details we have here. But the high point nine millimeter handgun that he was carrying in his waistband without a holster began to slip. He reached down to adjust the gun. It discharged. The bullet entered just above his penis and exited his scrotum. Did not have an Indiana handgun license. They sent the case to the the prosecutor's office for review. But, you know, I feel like the guy's suffered enough. Uh, Karen, I'll start with you. Well, I, <laughs> I'm sorry. It's just um, I struggle with this because the way he was carrying, I mean, that's just ridiculous. Okay, so I mean, he, yes, he suffered a lot, but. You kind of have that one coming. <laughs> I agree. Um, I mean, it's just everything about it is just set up to just go terribly wrong. And I think that and I'm kind of harsh and I'm kind of strict when it comes to gun safety and how you carry because it's people like that that make the middle ground people like, like always compared to my mom, you know, she's not anti-gun, but she has, I mean, I can pull my gun out. She's like, ah! you know, like it's just going to explode. Right. Um, those type of people that are not educated, hear something like that. And it reiterates to them, guns are dangerous. Guns are dangerous. See, they just go off on their own and they don't. I mean, if you carry it improperly, you don't have a proper holster, you know, obviously, but I think people like that just make it worse for, for us. And, um, I, think at this point, I mean, he, I'm sure he suffered, but he probably shouldn't carry a gun. Yeah. No, I mean, I, it's just, you've got to be responsible. Yep. And, and I said that in jest, like if he broke, <laughs> if he broke a law, he should absolutely pay the penalties. Uh, I, I agree with you a hundred percent on that. Leslie, what's your take? Um, you know, so I, I really agree with Karen that, I mean, I'm also one, I mean, I, I've got little, I, 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 I'm a mom, I'm a mom of three girls. Right. And so Safety is very, very important to me and for more reasons than just because I've got children. But yes, it does kind of when things like this happen, it shows it gives it gives ammunition, um, <laughs> pun intended, to the other side. Um, so, so, you know, it's like, yeah, we, we need as as gun owners, like we need to be responsible and we need to per, we need to show people that we are safe with our firearms. And I'm sorry, but shooting your penis off by accident, that is not a, that's not safety. <laughs> So, something's wrong there. It's, yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, if we're gonna if we're gonna ask the government to not pass ERPOs and stuff, then you, we can't have people like this walk on the streets. So yeah, I think that he, you know, if he broke the law, I don't, I'm not familiar with Indiana's handgun permit law. Is it like a CCW, or does everyone need a permit, or is it like a pistol permit? It, it mentions something about a license, but that's the extent of my knowledge. Okay. Yeah, I, I'm not sure about their laws there necessarily. But yeah, I mean, um, we were just discussing constitutional carry, which I, I support. But at the same time, if they've got these laws there, that's and he's and he's breaking them and then doing stupid stuff on top of it. Yeah, you know, to the gulag. Yep. <laughs> I, w- I was actually just getting ready to kind of bring up that other constitutional carry because, you know, in those cases, if we, if you don't have a requirement for education, then you end up with people like that doing things like this. Clearly this happened even, you know, regardless of what the laws are, we all, we all know that, but it, it's definitely an argument that the other side presents to us. And I'm like, look, you know, sometimes people are going to do stupid things and you play stupid games, you win stupid prizes. And I really don't see how that applies to our constitutional rights. Mm-hmm. Well, it all goes back to, uh, to training and um, how to do that without the government involvement. So, yeah, yeah. which oh. is on us. It's on us. Yep. So. Totally agree. And that's how I want it to be. I don't want the government. The government isn't here to control us. The government is here to, you know, do what the government does. I don't want them to control me and any push for them to have more control over us than they already do. I definitely rail against it. Next story, 21 of 33 counties in New Mexico declare themselves sanctuary counties. The New Mexico governor calls sanctuary movement NRA propaganda, rogue sheriffs throwing at childish pity party or bad faith critics. And another Colorado county votes to become a sanctuary county. Leslie, I know here in uh, Colorado, you are very involved in this. So maybe you could tell us, A, what a sanctuary county is, and B, kind of what this means in the landscape. 
Sure. So what a sanctuary county is, is um, a county that puts forth a resolution or like we saw in Oregon, they actually did ballot initiatives uh, declaring themselves these uh, sanctuary or preservation counties, which means that they will not put forth any uh, funding to enforce laws that the state might enact. So here in Colorado, the one that we're facing right now is the ERPO red flag law that's just the worst I've seen in the entire nation. And I follow these very closely. So in New Mexico, they're facing a lot more than we are here in Colorado, uh, which is kind of crazy because I think we're even more blue than they are, but we're pretty close. So basically, you know, it just says, you know, the sheriffs stand up, the states stand up, or the, I mean, I'm sorry, the sheriffs stand up, the commissioners stand up, or the or the voters, like if it's a ballot initiative, stand up and they say, we, we, we want to be exempt from your laws and we are going to become a sanctuary county for gun owners. And I think that's fantastic. And I was actually this, this morning, I spent my morning at the, um, Weld County here in Colorado, their board, their, their board of commissioners was meeting to pass, to discuss, and then eventually did pass a resolution, um, unanimously to make my county a constitutional, or not a constitutional, uh, uh, gun rights sanctuary county. And the sheriff was there and he absolutely supported it. This was actually, he was the one pushing it. The sheriffs are actually the ones pushing these in these counties. One thing I did find kind of interesting this morning when I had a chance during the, their, their work session to ask some questions was, the way it works is that these sanctuary counties only apply to unincorporated county, unincorporated part of the county. So if you actually live within city limits, like in Weld County, we have 72 municipalities. If you live within city limits, then it's up to the actual city to decide whether or not to um, abide by the sanctuary county or if they want to go ahead and enforce the law. Dang, it's uh, that that's actually a pretty interesting twist of events right there. Yeah, and I'll, I'll admit as closely as, as I follow this, this morning was the first time I've ever um, even thought to ask that question, and I was actually surprised by the answer. Yeah, absolutely. Do you think that uh, sanctuary counties are symbolic? Do you think it's useful? Do you think it'll catch on? I do. I, th- I think they're very symbolic. I mean, when you have, like you said, like right now in New Mexico, I mean, what was it, 29 out of 33? I mean, that's a, yeah. an enormous piece of the state that says we are not going to enforce, we refuse to put any uh, county funds forth to enforce these laws. And the truth is, is that even with the municipality piece of it, the municipalities rely on county help, especially, I mean, little tiny towns don't, they don't have the money to store firearms. They don't have the money to get SWAT teams at doors, searching homes. I mean, so are they going to enforce these anyways when the county steps up and says, we're not going to, it gives them a reason to step up and say, neither are we. So I do think what they're doing is very important. I think it's partly symbolic, but I think it's partly um, very realistic at the same time. So that, I mean, it could eventually be challenged. I mean, the, the, the court could come back, the state court could come back and end up challenging the counties. I mean, here in Colorado, this is kind of a, a fun fact I always like to throw out. The only person with more power, the only the only elected official with more power than the sheriff is actually the coroner. So the coroner is the only person who can remove the sheriff. So ultimately, the sheriff is really, really the big dogs in these counties. So I, I think that what they're doing, I think it's fantastic. I support it 100%. And we're actually working across the state right now to try to get other counties to do this. I think we're on like 17 counties already in Colorado. They're popping up every day. I mean, the the, the, the mainstream media can't even keep up. I love it. The optics are really good. Karen Hunter, what do you think about all this? I think that if that could catch on, like catch on, I think it gives, it's like a ray of hope. There's so many people that feel hopeless in this fight. And I think that if that catches on and kind of like ripple effects everywhere, people could be almost very hopeful. And I think when people have hope, they don't feel like there's no use. They'll get out and vote. They'll get out and become active. They'll speak up. And I think that's the biggest problem in a 2A community is our voice isn't heard because so many people don't speak up. And a lot of people think, well, it's just useless. It's, you know, everything is against us. So I think if that's accurate and that catches on and it's not just something that's symbolic, We can almost maybe see hope for a big change. Yeah. I think. I would like that a lot. Moving on from there, the ATF gets burned trying to memorialize the agents killed in Waco. So this happened a few days ago. They posted on their Facebook page on this day, 26 years ago, four ATF agents were killed in the line of duty in a mission outside of Waco, Texas. And good Lord, they, uh, they, they got burned. One guy said, this is not going to go like you think it's going to go. 
uh, very early in the comment thread. I just wanted to read just a few of the best comments and the, these might be a little bit tough, but I thought that they were generally pretty right on Uh comment. ATF was burning kids alive before shooting dogs was cool. Comment ATF agent one. We really need to work on our image after shooting so many dogs. ATF agent two. Here's an idea. Let's remind everyone about that time. We burned down a church full of women and children mission to protect the public by lighting them on fire. Weird flex, but okay. Uh, this post uh, I won't say that one. <laughs> Can't wait until the Kent State Massacre appreciation thread. And I think that's fair. I, I'm generally uh, very critical of the ATF's actions in Waco. Uh, and I thought that they kind of deserve to be roasted a bit. But it's kind of interesting having these uh, government organizations on Facebook and social media and thinking that it's important and doing what they did. Karen, I'll start with you. What, what's your take on all this? Um, I agree with you. I think it's I think it's fair and I think it's deserved. I think that, again, there's that middle crowd that doesn't understand. And when they memorialize these agents like that and, you know, it is a government agency and things, they're trying to touch base with, oh, you know, sympathy and and people that don't know, they just, people don't know what they don't know, basically. And um, so I think that when people go on and put the truth out there and even though it sounds harsh, it is, it is what it is. Does that make sense? Yeah, it a hundred percent does. And, and to be perfectly honest, like I'm, I'm sad that the ATF agents died. Like the, the, these decisions were made so far above their heads. I don't know anything about their character or what they were, but generally, you know, these decisions are made up there and then they, they choose to follow through with them or not. But Leslie, what are your thoughts? Yeah, you know, I, so I'm very, I'm very much with you in that, um, you know, I can empathize with their families and understand how government is so dysfunctional and how it works that it isn't like they, they had these, dis- they, it isn't like they went in there and said, we want to do this. Or they even, I mean, or even knew what they were getting themselves into. Did they even know what they were doing? I think that's a really good question about Waco that I've kind of always had. What is really frustrating is that it's the ATF is almost acting like prideful. It's the pride aspect of this that I think pisses people off the most. Because when you, when they say act like what they did was a good thing, like, I mean, it's sad we lost these, it's, it's sad we lost a lot of people, right? Yeah. No, no, whether, no matter what side that we're on, it's, that's, that's, that's the sad part of it. But the pride that the government has in, in their actions is what I think is, is despicable. And I actually went to that thread on Facebook and I read all the comments as well. And my only comment was just gross. Yeah. <laughs> that was just literally all I said. Yeah. But, um, you know, when we see this all the time on Facebook with all these government agencies and whether it's because they found, you know, a tiny bit of marijuana on somebody and they're like, yeah, look what we did. We're just these big, bad, awesome law, you know, law enforcement, you know, officials. And it's, it's just like, do, do they have empathy for the people is the, is the big question because I don't see, I don't feel that they do. Yeah. I, I a hundred percent agree. I think that a better way to phrase this and get their point across would be like on this day, 26 years ago, four ATF agents were killed in the line of duty in a mission outside Waco, Texas. Uh, we, we mourn for all the lost life in the, in, in this incident. And we had a lot of valuable lessons that made us able to, uh, protect not only the public, but our agents better in the future. Something like that, maybe like would have been a lot better. Yeah. And, and no ATF, you can't hire me. Get bent. <laughs> I'm not feeling it. You're like, you're like the new PR guy. <laughs> <laughs> nope. <laughs> not going to do it. Uh, next story, New York police officer arrested for making and selling guns illegally. So this is a police officer who was charged with it. Basically, he was manufacturing firearms and selling it to motorcycle gangs and things like that. And what happened is there was another sting that was going on for, gosh, where is it? I had it highlighted, but oh yeah, there it is. A cocaine and fentanyl trafficking investigation that was dubbed Operation Bread, White, and Blues resulted in more than two dozen arrests. Now, apparently this cop who was manufacturing uh, illegal firearms for these uh, motorcycle gangs and whatnot, and people who were prohibited people. Uh, he tipped off one of the major people in that case. So not only is he manufacturing stuff for all these people, but he's giving them information and tipping them off. One of the one of the top guys there said, "This has to be one of the most egregious breaches of trust that I've encountered. I'm furious. Number one, about the leak in the case, and number two, the conduct, the possibility of putting untraceable guns on the street. And this is the kind. Of, this is exactly it. Like." I, I, I'm almost speechless in it just because it's so utterly ridiculous. This, this cop is out there literally putting these guns on the streets that are putting him, the general public, uh, the blue brotherhood and everyone else in danger. And it, it makes me so mad. Leslie, what are you, how about you? Yeah, definitely. And, um, you know, I, 
I would love to see a mom's demand action up in arms over this, right? You know, why aren't they screaming and yelling about the about these type of things? Because they always blame us. It's the law-abiding gun owners that are irresponsible or doing, you know, or that we sold our guns to somebody that's bad, which just, just just doesn't happen on our level. So we're always the ones that are, you know, punished for these actions of what these people are doing out there, the, the, you know, the criminals on the streets. And when you have a, you know, a law enforcement officer that's doing stuff like this, it's like, well, let's, let's put, let's, let's look at that too. I mean, these issues are out there and undoubtedly if there's one, there's, there's more than one. I mean, this is probably only one of many and, um, you know, not to, not to dig on law enforcement at all, but the truth is, is that there are corrupt people within the system, no matter what level they're on. And they do stuff like this. And, you know, I'm glad he got caught, yeah. you know, because it, mm-hmm. it, it proves it proves our point, which is that the bad guys, you know, the ones that are putting those guns on the streets are not us. Yeah. Karen. Mm-hmm. Um, I agree with Leslie. It's I mean, it makes you irate to hear things like that. But that's just one that was caught. You know, there's corruption everywhere. I think that as far as the 2A community goes, I don't think it looks as bad on us because, you know, we are law law abiding citizens. Yeah. I think that it's sad that it makes people kind of reiterate to them that you can't trust the system. You can't trust police officers. Um, I think they should put a high point in his pants and let it go off. No, I'm hundred <laughs> <laughs> percent no, with you. No, but seriously, I mean, it's just, um, you know, it's like Leslie said, these are going on into the streets. So even if you ban guns, even if you take them away from law abiding citizens, there's always going to be a way that bad guys are going to get weapons or guns or whatever. I mean, so it's just not the answer. So in some ways it's kind of good that he was caught in that because it reiterates that point, getting rid of guns isn't going to get rid of the the crime. Yeah. The problem. Cause yeah, there's, there's people out there doing bad things, no matter what, no matter how many laws there are that we put into place. And by we, I mean them. Uh, <laughs> North Carolina moves one step closer to arming teachers. Uh, There's a new bill that lets North Carolina teachers bring guns to school, clears the first hurdle. All right, this is pretty interesting. This is House Bill 216, also known as the School Self-Defense Act. It passed its first reading on Thursday. I think this one is pretty interesting. It, it has a requirement of yearly drug tests and 16 hours of training. It's a little bit less than I'd like to see, but I'm still, you know, I'm still for the concept of this 100%. There is an educator that's pretty upset about it. He says, we barely make a living wage. I don't want to be asked to shoot a child, uh, says an 11th grade teacher that I'm not even going to bother saying his name. Says, I know a lot of teachers, but I don't know any that would ever want to carry a gun in their classroom. And that's funny because I've actually trained a bunch of teachers that uh, that want to carry firearms and administrators. They want to carry firearms in their classrooms. I've spent a lot of my time over the last couple of years teaching them the skills to survive in, in cases of active killer uh, situations and things like that. So I know tons of them. I don't know who this guy knows, but that's not it. Uh, he said, I think it's a terrible idea. We don't need a bunch of teachers running around with guns who don't know what's going on if they hear lockdown, lockdown. Supporters of the bill say allowing school staff to carry guns is the best first line of defense in a case of a school shooting. I think that I, that I pretty much agree with that. Uh, Karen, why don't you start us off on this one? I absolutely agree. I think that one knowing that the teachers are armed, so an active shooter is going to be less likely to enter the building and, and do that because he's going to be at a, or she would be at a disadvantage, you know, out num- you know, numbered, out armed, whatever. Um, so it's a huge deterrent too. I think that yes, they would need more training. However, I think something's better than nothing. And just the confidence that it would give these teachers and the children feel safe. But he said he didn't want to shoot a, a child. Who does? So I'm assuming he's think is that what he said? Yeah. So he's just like like the active shooter is going to be a student. Well, even if that were the case, it needs to be looked at as instead of oh I don't want to shoot this child. Look at all the children you're going to save. Would he rather a child being there with a gun or someone being there with a gun and just you know yeah take lives and there's no way to defend against it? But anyway, I think it's a wonderful thing and. I hope it goes and I hope it spreads. We, uh, we always put a scenario into our force on force medical training, uh, in, in situations when we're teaching administrators and teachers and educators and things like that. We put us, we put a situation in there where it's a, you know, a child who's, you know, walking back and forth with a knife, something like that, pacing back, back and forth, being crazy. And it's incredibly difficult for everyone who goes through that scenario. It's, it's almost impossible, but people have to understand 
that the day may come where, you know, there is an individual that's, that's hurting people, harming people, killing people, whatever, it, whatever it may be. And I personally always choose everyone else around them, the innocent people over the, over the person who's, you know, a killer, just bottom line. Leslie, what do you think? You know, I, I'm a mother and my, my two youngest daughters, I mean, all three of my daughters grew up in the, what I call the era of school shootings, the era of lockdowns, the era of lockouts, things like that. Um, and my two youngest are still, you know, they're both in elementary school, one's seven and one's 11. And whenever there is a school shooting, you know, as, as a mother, <laughs> of course, all of us kind of go to that place where we say to ourselves, like, God, what, like, what would happen if this happened at my child's school? And it's a terrifying thought, absolutely terrifying thought. But you know what's even more terrifying to me? That that would happen and that there would be nobody there to defend them. That is the most terrifying thought to me as a mother. So I absolutely support, um, you know, concealed carry in schools and I support Faster Colorado. What they do is fantastic. And even here in college, you know, Faster has some very extensive training that they put into training teachers and, and, and whatnot. But here in Colorado, it's been legal for I don't even know how many years, long time. If you have the permission of the school board to conceal carry in schools and rural districts in Colorado have been doing it for a long time. Yep. And they, and without the, tra- without the drug tests and without the training that they, that this bill even requires and they don't have issues. Um, I love the aspect of the more extensive training. I think it's very important and I, um, which is why I support organizations like Faster so, so dearly. But ultimately, I mean, the, 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 this teacher to be like, well, I don't want to be in that position where I have to shoot a student. Well, nobody's asking him to do that. Yeah. And you're mm-hmm. right. There are tons of teachers that would, that would do this. And it's not like the Wild West. Like he has this vision in his head that everyone's just going to have a gun on their hip running around the schools like the Wild West. No, I mean, any teacher that volunteer volunteers is the big, big piece of this. Um, to do that, they genuinely care and they are and they want to be trained. So, yeah, I mean, I, I absolutely support the uh, idea of arming teachers. And I th- wish we could I wish we'd see it more often. Yeah. One of the bill sponsors, Representative Larry Pittman, says uh, and and is quoted in the article here, I am sick and tired of students and school personnel being defenseless, sitting ducks for people who want to come into gun free zones and attack them. There are teachers who have concealed carry permits who are willing to get further training to be the first line of defense if necessary or the second line of defense if the school resource officer goes down. Their right to life dictates their right to self-defense. We're not talking about making anyone be armed if they do not wish to do so, but those who are willing and capable to defend themselves and the children while waiting for police to arrive have the right to do so, and that right should not be hindered or infringed. And I think that's very well said. Next story, 20-year-old wannabe rapper arrested for threatening cop on video. I don't know if you guys watch this video, but it's pretty crazy. Uh, there's an aspiring rapper, don't care about his name, but he, he's been arrested for threatening to murder an I'm sorry, a uniformed Chicago police officer in a viral Facebook live video. Basically, he's sitting in the car. He's got two guns on his lap. He says, we're going to kill him. You better mind your mother bleep in business bleep. Uh, I'm going to kill you. He pans the camera to the officer. He's like basically kind of taunting the guy. I don't know if he had tinted windows or what the, what the cop was doing. Just goes on and on and on and on. And finally the officer, you know, turns or, you know, continues on whatever it was. He wasn't messing with him. He wasn't going to pull him over. He was literally beside them at a stoplight. And this is one of those things where I'm like, cops have a tough job. You know, that cop's sitting, that officer is literally sitting in his SUV at a stoplight, probably has no idea that this stuff's going on in the car next to him, that there's death threats, that there's multiple firearms. And this is a prohibited person, by the way. He's also already been arrested on two occasions in 2015 with unlawful use of a weapon. So clearly not a good dude. And he's just making a huge joke out of the entire thing. It's a... it's, it was pretty tough for me to watch just knowing that, you know, our officers actually have to do that. There's definitely bad people on the forces out there, but generally I think that most cops are, are really good people and the things that they have to deal with on a, on a daily basis like this, uh, it, you know, it really makes me feel for them. Karen, what do you think? It angers me. Here's the thing that I think is lost on the younger generation. You cannot just say whatever you want for free. And what they've learned is there's no consequences. There's no consequences. Like there's no consequences in school. Teachers hands are tied. They can't look at a child cross-eyed or teach them any amount of respect without it. Oh, that's not positive reinforcement. And all the lines are so blurred. So like 
someone like him that he thinks he's funny or he, or whatever. He's just trash. I'm yeah, sorry. He that's is. Fine. But, um, you know, he's just saying whatever he wants and he's broadcasting it. And I mm-hmm. think that he should be punished. I think that he should be arrested. I think that even though nothing physical happened, it was a threat. It should be taken seriously. It was against our law enforcement. We have a hard enough time already. And I think being punished mm-hmm. will send a message to everyone else that, you know what, you might want to watch what you say. You might want to watch what you do. You just cannot say whatever you want for free. Yeah. You just You just can't. Hundred percent. It's like you know, there's it, this is real life. Like people on the internet, they think that there's no repercussions for their actions. They can do whatever they want. They can do whatever. But this just goes to show this is actually real life. This is people's lives. This is, I mean, this isn't conducive to to society's well being. And there's clearly repercussions. Leslie, yeah, that's pretty disgusting. I, I actually hadn't heard about this at all. You know, I, there's one thing I always say about like police brutality, which does, which does exist. There are, there are bad cops within the force. Um, there's, there's bad people everywhere and they, they wear different uniforms, whether it's a, a trash truck uniform or a, a police officer uniform, bad people just exist. So we do have, you know, we have that, that issue there. But then, then at the same, and I always say that, that when they, th- that issue in itself, creates fear within the community of like law abiding people. And then you have people like this rapper who does stuff like this and he creates fear within the law enforcement community. So all it does is just make this divide further, which makes things honestly, in my, my opinion, more and more dangerous. And I think, you know, I, I'm glad that they arrested him to be honest with you. I had a situation like last year, maybe a little over a year ago now where I had somebody in my own town. I live in a tiny little town. Um, and I had to be in my own town who was sending me messages on Facebook saying things like, I hope someone puts a bullet in your brain, your, your attention seeking bleep. Um, I mean, really, really horrible messages, especially having somebody in my little town saying these things to me. And so I, of course, called the police. The police told me they couldn't do anything about it because he said he hoped somebody would do it, not that he was going to do it. I mean, so it was like these little lines. And I'm like, so this person's just going to continue to be out there who clearly wants to do me harm um, with a firearm, which you guys are supposed to be so afraid of. Uh, you know, I mean, or the, not, not the, not, you know, not the police officer, but the community. It's like it's supposed to be such a serious issue and you refuse to do anything. I mean, talk about like ERPO stuff right there. I mean, like, yeah. I mean, why, why can't you guys go over? I mean, I, it makes no sense to me why that individual could not have been charged and he ended up you know, backing off and, and everything, but it you know, still creates fear. You know, it's like, I'm not going to stop speaking up for what I believe in because people want to threaten me and I, and people and police officers shouldn't have to say, I'm not going to, you know, do my job because people are threatening me. Uh, so I'm, I'm actually just really glad to see he got arrested. Yeah. Yeah. Me too. That's, that's pretty crazy. It's all about the, you know, the, what, what do they call it? Well, the first amendment, it's uh inciting action is, is what mm-hmm. it is. Not just hoping something bad happens, which is so, I mean, I get it, but the fact that cops can't do stuff about stuff like that, that's, that's, it's harassment at the very minimum. Yeah. Yeah. It's scary. Washington moves to reduce concealed carry. Washington lawmakers uh, are, are basically mapping a strategy to reduce concealed carry there. How they're doing that is they're putting a new set of uh, requirements and criteria in so that anyone applying for a concealed pistol license would have to take a minimum of eight hours of instruction. I want to read the, what what it includes. Basic firearm safety rules, safe handling of firearms, firearm and suicide prevention, safe storage of firearms, state and federal firearms laws, uh, state laws pertaining to use of deadly force, techniques for avoiding a criminal attack and how to manage a violent confrontation, including conflict resolution, firearms and children, including safe storage of firearms and, taking, uh, and talking to children about firearm safety. And live fire shooting exercises on a firing range that includes a demonstration by the applicant of safe handling of and shooting proficiency with each firearm that the applicant is applying to be licensed to carry. I think that's a great list voluntarily because, again, the Second Amendment is a right. And this is definitely uh, an impediment to people actually exercising uh, their naturally born, their naturally given rights. A, this costs money, so it's kind of a Jim Crow law because it basically takes people who are too poor to afford it, uh, takes self-defense away from them. And makes them break the law, which kind of it's it's a vicious cycle. Uh, some of these things are very uh, very unclear onto what the very specific key features of what they're trying to get across are. And this is just it's bad news disguised in good news because this makes it tougher for people to actually 
to get a concealed carry permit, to defend their lives, to carry a firearm, to exercise the Second Amendment. Uh, Leslie, I'll start off with you on this one. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, we, we just talked a little bit earlier when we discussed the constitutional carry that um, that kind of like privilege part of it is something that really bothers me and it always has. And maybe it's because, you know, I mean, it's because, you know, I'm a single mom and I, I know what it's like to, to be poor and need self-defense. I mean, I've got a kid that's, you know, trying to tell me he wants me to put a bullet in my brain. And, you know, and, you know, I've definitely reached a point now where financially I'm a lot more stable, but I've, I've been in that place where something like that would just be completely out of reach. So then what well, I don't deserve self-protection. So I think that that's a huge, a huge issue to me. I actually wrote a story or wrote an article um, earlier this year or end of last year, I think it was about a young woman in Washington who was in a, in a road rage incident with a gentleman who start who, kind of like uh, pushed her on her motorcycle off the road. And this was in Washington, pushed her off the road. She was 23. He was 60. He pushed her off the road with his truck. They both, you know, he got out of his truck and he started beating her. Like he was beating her and she thought she was going to die. And she had a concealed carry and she pulled out her, her handgun and she shot him and he, he did die. And the whole, the whole point of my story was not only that, but he popped up on this gun violence memorial being memorialized. Uh, I saw that. Victim. Yeah. So I was the one that broke that story and ended up kind of going viral. But I mean, there's an example of, of somebody right there that, you know, could potentially be who has, who has used this to save her own life and could potentially be uh, hindered from doing that it, it, with laws like this. And then the other question I always have is, you know, I, is how much, how much is the gut, the anti-gun lobby spending on lobbying for this bill? Because you know what they could do if this really mattered to them, they could take that money and they could offer free firearms training to conceal carry holders. I mean, what they're doing is it's just, it's just, again, goes back to wanting less people to have guns. Yep. Karen. Um, I agree. I think that, like what you said, is bad news disguises good news. On the outside looking in, it looks all, oh, this is, this could be something, but it's just another one of those things where if we can't blatantly just take it away, let's make it as difficult as we can for as many people as we can. And it just keeps happening one by one by one by one more to where either people are breaking the law just so they can have a gun because they can't afford it or, yeah, so... I think it's just a sneaky little way that they're getting what they want. It is. And and they disguise it in something that might make sense unless you actually apply some critical thought to it. You don't want the government doing this. That's why I'm against, honestly, national reciprocity, because I don't want the government setting the standards for, for all these different. I don't want the government, the federal government overriding states' rights and what they decide. They're also going to set standards just like this. So if we have national national reciprocity, it's going to be probably – the same stuff because it's probably written by the same bill writers that probably work for the anti-gun, uh, you know, Bloomberg and his minions. And, you know, I, I just, I don't want the federal government, the state government, whatever, putting those kind of impediments in place because it is a form of gun control. So even if it does make a little bit of sense to people out there, don't fall for it. Which makes it a slow conditioning. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Which has already happened to the nth degree in our nation anyway. So people don't even realize how conditioned they're becoming. Totally. To 100%. Like yep. I'm going to move into our I'm offended segment. And the first one is uh, the New York red flag bill would allow teachers to report you as a danger. This comes to us from bearing arms and I'll read just a little bit of it for you. The red flag law got the green light in New York on Monday. The law allows courts to temper- temporarily seize firearms from people who are showing red flags or signs of violent behavior. Uh, let's see. Nancy Pelosi was there, blah, blah, blah. Other states have similar laws. New York is the first state to give teachers and school administrators the power to pursue court intervention if they believe someone poses a threat to themselves or others. Kind of interesting, right? So a judge can then order an evaluation for the person or persons in question and remove firearms from their possession if they see fit. They say that this would have stopped, uh, the, the shooter in, in Parkland, Florida, the killer in Parkland, Florida. And, Actually, there was a, a thousand opportunities to stop that person. Red flag laws be damned. Uh, they just didn't do what they needed to do at multiple levels of law enforcement, both federal and state. They just didn't didn't do what they needed to do. This is kind of interesting to me. I'm like, well, generally high school kids, uh, middle school kids don't own firearms because generally it's not legal. And I, I are they going to remove these from their parents because of it? And Clearly, there's a lot of activist teachers that are, that are anti-gun and, you know, someone wears a gun shirt to a school. The teacher then says, oh, this is a problem. And now now that kid's, you know, out of school, 
expelled whatever it is uh, in some kind of treatment program and all the firearms are removed from the parents. This is just uh, government overreach. Leslie, talk me down. <laughs> I, 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 I think it's bad news. It's kind of funny because as you're reading that, I was just thinking back to the our conversation just a minute ago about the teacher in North Carolina who is worried about overreacting teachers in that situation, <laughs> you know, but I mean, so it's like, but they don't care about overreacting teachers in this situation. They don't care about them because of the people who will be harmed when it's, when it's the people, when it's the gun owners who are the ones who are going to be harmed in a, in a, with a law like this, then they don't care. And that's just, I mean, that is just across the board. It is blatant. And I, it, it really, really disgusts me because Honestly, that's what I would probably worry about the most is that is them being triggered. I mean, and, and it's I mean, I, and I can understand that as, as, a, as a mom with kids in school. Sometimes these things get scary. They go on lockdown for one reason or another. And, yeah, as a mom, you're like, what the heck is going on? i being a teacher in those scenarios. I could understand why you would have more fear. But I could see it definitely if it wasn't just activist teachers, which is a whole other uh, part of this, but just but just fearful teachers that are overreacting. And then before you know it, you've got. Yeah, I mean, that's the other thing is like the students shouldn't even own firearms because they're too young, especially in New York. I mean, and then so what are they going to do? Go to the parents homes, the, the family members homes. I mean, how are they going to determine all of that? Just that, that just seems like kind of definitely very crazy. And I think there's so many, I, I like to always talk about solutions, you know, so is this a problem? It, it might, it probably is. So how could we, without creating a law, how could the schools create some sort of a system where, you know, a school counselor discusses it with the parents or like, how can we just, how can we just stop going right to the cops? How can we stop going right to the police and to the government and to a law into confiscating guns? Like there is, there's, there's, it's not black and white. So let's let's find that space in between. Karen, this is just bad news all the way around. I think because um, one, what would give the teachers the right to determine? So you think obviously there's actions that would seem you know you can tell when somebody's being irate or somebody's being you know there's levels right, but at what point does it get to? Oh, they looked at me cross-eyed. Oh, you know, you're out. That's this. Yeah. That's that. You know, there's no. There's no balance. There's no line. So the scary thing is, uh, we'll just pretend, you know, I have a kid in school, right? And maybe he gets an argument with another child or whatever. And it's, oh, you know, you're out. You know, you were hostile and whatever, whatever. And it wasn't even that bad. So now, they're, you know, he doesn't have a gun. He's not 21. So where are they going to come? My house. And if you come to my house and you look in my gun cave, you're going to find tons of ammo, tons of guns. You know, this is what I do for a living, but that's going to appear. Oh, this is what's wrong with this kid. His, you know, look what he's around. Look what's in the house. What's she planning? Do you see what I'm saying? So I think it's just bad on so many levels. I don't think that teachers should have the power to do anything like that because there are some good teachers, but there are some very liberal minded teachers that um, would not even be able to gauge properly, yeah. you know, a level of behavior. Do you know what I'm saying? Totally. I just think that there's some things that shouldn't be taken out of the art, you know, the hands of the police or, you know, certain authorities. That's just my opinion. But, yeah. um, Due process. Like it yeah. exists for a reason. I think that well, that's something that could go crazy fast. The the other thing too that should be really that should be talked about in this in scenarios like this would actually be racial profiling because that would be a whole nother target that I could see you know certain teachers having. Um, so I mean, yeah, I it's, it's out of control. <laughs> yeah, a hundred percent. And then uh, our last normal story is House passes ten day waiting for background checks. This still has to go to the Senate. But yeah, this is basically toughening background check system. We talked about this earlier in that Trump said that he's going to veto it for a lot of really good reasons. His reasons for doing or the White House's reasons for doing so were were definitely well thought out. But Karen, what, what do you think about this? Do you think it's going to go through? Do you think it's going to be stopped? Do you think it'll have to go to presidential veto? I don't know. I think if it does, I think it will get vetoed. I think it's um, it's just crazy. I mean, we have illegals here getting driver's licenses and voting, but law by citizens have to wait 10 days. I mean, it's just, it's crazy. I don't, I just, I don't see it flying. I hope not. I don't know. Yeah. I think that I, I, I want to say that, um, I have faith in president Trump that he'll do what he says he'll do. 
I hope so. But I could see it almost getting that far. I don't know. I agree. Leslie? Um, you know, I, I again, I, I need to probably do examine the makeup of the Senate and kind of see – who we have that might be squishy on guns in there to really determine if it would go, if it would go very far. I, I think, I think the bill is, I mean, I think all it will do is push gun sales to the black market. I mean, you know, that's the thing is like you, you we already have background checks. I mean, here in Colorado, we've got the universal background checks, you know, and we, we've got a pretty enhanced background check bill. A lot of it isn't even followed, to be honest with you. No, not at all. It's, 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 um, I think I mean, all I, these laws that they passed in 2013, none of them are even upheld. Yeah. So, you know, I think this is, it just, it, it'll just, if all it will do is push, it'll just push it out of the hands of, of the retailers into the private market, which ultimately could end up being the black market. It could end up, end up being, buy, you're buying a gun from that cop who's making guns. Yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> selling them on the black market. Cause you know what? If it comes down to it and you want a firearm, you're going to get it. If you want to harm somebody or you want to harm yourself, you're going to find a different way to do it if you can't find a gun. It doesn't do anything about the violence situation or the suicide situation. It's another band aid on a problem that the society has, which is, you know, not guns. The guns are just a tool. Yep. All right. Uh, let's move into our full auto news segment. This is just some crazy stuff. You guys picked some good ones. Uh, Karen, I'm going to start off with you. What was your story? Well, my story is about Chiquita and John. So Chiquita and John are, are had a, <laughs> I can't even. okay. So they're at a buffet and they had been waiting 20 minutes for the crab legs to come out. I don't know what happened. They had the, you know, the service tongs yeah. and, Maybe John grabbed the crab leg that Chiquita wanted or vice versa, but they began to fight. Not just fight, but they were fencing with their service tongs. Like she lacerated his head and his mugshot, there's a big band-aid and a cut on his head. <laughs> um, plates were shattering. I mean, it was like a show. So I thought that was really interesting. So she is charged with assault, Miss Chiquita, and John was charged with disorderly conduct. Point is that place must have excellent crab legs fire crab legs <laughs> oh, I, <can> <laughs> I know now now i'm craving crab legs thanks a lot right. <laughs> i'll fight you for it <laughs> well uh, okay fine <laughs> i'm still in uh, uh leslie have you ever fought anybody for crab legs i have not <laughs> I, I haven't either <laughs> yeah uh, i mean we're living, i'm in colorado crab legs you know if you get them it's like you're really spoiled and super special so yeah. <laughs> Red Lobster, though. <laughs> yeah, I don't have one nearby me, so uh, I haven't been there. I, I actually went to a buffet not too long ago that had, like, all-you-can-eat crab legs, and they and I definitely would have fought somebody for them, I have to admit. <laughs> so, but they it. were all-you-can-eat. There was plenty. <laughs> love it. I'm going to Louisiana in the middle of crawfish season, uh, and it's not crab, but I'm pretty excited about crawfish be boils. Careful. I don't. I don't – I'm not going to be. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Women are vicious. I know. I'm going to bring it to him. Uh, Le <laughs> Leslie, what was, your, what was your story? Okay. So my story was, this is actually, I thought it was a funny story. I, I kind of can relate to it actually, because this happened to me once. <laughs> so I was Whoa. going through, your, through these stories. So this Florida woman bitten by stray kitten billed by hospital for $48,000. My funeral would have been cheaper is what she said. And it's true. So basically this woman is uh, you know, 44 year old woman. She, she sees this emaciated black kit on the roadside and she wants to you know pick it up and take care of it. Well, um, I was actually a veterinary technician for 10 years, and I know what happens when you pick up sick cats. They bite you. So that's what happened. This kitten bit her. And, of course, it's this very sickly-looking kitten, and what do you want? You don't want to just be bit by it. So she goes to the hospital, and, you know, um, <laughs> they go through all these things. And honestly, I'm not sure if the cat lived or died. It doesn't actually say in this article that I saw. But if the cat died or it was put to sleep, what they actually do is they have to uh, remove its head and they test its brain for yeah, rabies. Yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah, it's really crazy. So anyways, I'm not sure if that happened or not. And then, you know, they get, or it gets quarantined for seven days. But this hospital apparently just decided to just offer her the whole gamut. Like anything you want, you get. Um, she got everything from like antibiotics to injections to uh rabies shot. I mean, it was like everything. And then she's a, 
and then she gets this, uh, you know, $48,000 bill and she's just like, what? Like how, like how could it possibly have been this much? And, um, so she starts looking it up and everything. And she literally said, my funeral would have been cheaper. And it's, it's true. And they ended up, uh, the hospital later ended up lowering some of the prices for the rabies immuno, immunoglobulin. And, you know, things like that, just because she did push back, which I'm really glad she did. People don't usually speak up to things like this. But this actually happened to me once. Um, I, I, I saw this cat. It was at night, and I was driving down the road. I was like 17, I think, or maybe I was 18. But I'm on the, I'm on the road, and I see this cat in the middle of the road, and I think it's my actually my cat. It looks just like my cat. So I get out. I think it's my cat. It had been hit by a car. I thought it was dead. So I get out, and I pick it up, and I put it on my lap. My boyfriend was driving. And I think this cat is dead, literally. And we're almost back to my house. And this cat wakes up, bites me, and then dies. So I was like, oh, my God. Same thing happened to me. And um, I, at least, though, denied, like, all the care. I said, well, cut its head off and send the brain off for rabies. And if I need anything, call me and let me know. But, uh, yeah, I can see how that could happen for sure. Crazy story. It, it um, is. <laughs> Karen, have you ever been treated for rabies? once. No, I'm kidding. But I did have a stray cat in my backyard. It's kind of a funny story. Well, I had gotten hit and I think somebody put it in my backyard, but it was like trying to attack my dog. So I called the animal, whatever. And they're like, oh, sorry, cats are feral. I'm like, cats are feral? Okay, fine. So they said, call the police. So I called the police and I live in a small town. So the sheriff comes out and he's <laughs> like, well, you're going to have to catch it. That's why I called you. I, I don't want to touch it. Like, it's yeah. like, you know, angry. And I said, I, I, and it's, you know, it's hurt. It had been hit. And um, I said, I think it's going to live. And I was like, it probably needs to be shot. He said, do you want to shoot it? <laughs> no. <laughs> I said, it's not legal. I mean, my town's called a little village. I was like, I can't shoot it. He's like, I, I can't shoot it. I'm like, well, can I take your gun and shoot it? He's like, no. <laughs> I was like, well, what? He's like, just take, get it in a box. And I'm like, and leave it at the Humane Society's doorstep. I'm like, okay, I'm not touching it. But he left. He left the little cat in my backyard. So I had to get a shovel and get a bucket and try to catch it. It did not bite me though. So <laughs> that's good. Yeah, it was uh, crazy. You know, it's kind of crazy about this story and not totally off topic with guns or whatever, but they, they apparently like change the prices of medications based on what they're charged. And normally the cost of the rabies immune globulin is $361 and 26 cents. But, uh, she got 12 millimeters of it and that's per milliliter. So normally she would have been charged $4,335. But at the time that it happened, apparently they, they, it was, there was a shortage of it. So they charged her $7,737 per two, two, uh, per two millimeter dose. And then like a month later, lowered it down to 1,650 for 12 milliliters. That's like, that's kind of crazy. I didn't realize that the cost of medicines and stuff that they used went up and down based on availability. I mean, it makes sense, but wow, yeah, yeah. <laughs> pretty, pretty crazy. All right. Well, that's going to do it for our stories tonight. But before we go, I want to give you guys a chance to talk about what you've been up to and where people can find you. Uh, Karen, the cat lady, <laughs> <laughs> what have you been up to and where can oh, people find you? Lady. Exactly. Well, I'm on LinkedIn, Twitter, and Instagram, Kale Hunter 42. This year for me is a lot of firearms training classes, a lot. I have a bunch of things going on that I'm under an NDA and I can't talk about right now. So Ooh. I know one's with SIG. I can at least say that. So I'm excited about that. It's going to be exciting. And there's some other things, but lots of articles coming out, lots of training, lots of podcasts, things like that. So That's I'm excited. Very cool. What's your favorite article that you've written recently? Ah. Uh, that's hard. Um, the one that just came out today in personal defense world, I kind of like that. It's, um, the modern day Valkyrie. So it's about basically women shooters, but it's not this, you know, girl power empowerment. I mean, you know, my ideals on that, yeah, but yeah. it's about women that, you know, take their training seriously. They take their shooting seriously. They know their guns, but it's just your moms, your, you know, uh, or the t women in the tactical, you know, arena in the military or law enforcement, but they also know their roles as being a feminine woman and that it's okay that there's differences between men and women. We can't all do the same thing as each other. We all have our role. So it's kind of like being able to be a shooter. Everyone's seen as a shooter, you know, a gun is not gender specific, just knows hands. You know what I mean? So it's about that. So I'm kind of excited about that. It's a little different than a lot of the, um, I think a little bit differently, but, um, 
That's okay. <laughs> Very cool. I'll definitely check it out. Uh, personal defense world for that one, right? Yes. And Kale Hunter 42 everywhere else. Yes. All right. That's awesome. Thanks so much for being here, Karen. Oh, thanks for having me. Sorry I was late. Uh, no problem. I get it. Stuff happens. Uh, <laughs> let, I know that's what Kenny texted me. He told me. <laughs> <laughs> Leslie, how about you? Uh, what have you been up to? You said that you were uh, doing the sanctuary county stuff today, but you get up to a lot, right? I do. I'm kind of, I've got, I'm, I've got my hands in pretty much anything that has to do with gun rights and activism and, um, organizing, uh, the gun owners and the gun rights activists. I always emphasize they don't have to be gun owners to support gun rights. But yeah, so I have an organization called Rally for Our Rights and we are dedicated. We're not nonpartisan, which is a big part of what we do. Nonpartisan, uh, dedicated to defending the Second Amendment, uh, through like frontline activism. A political action, things like that. We just get involved in absolutely everything. And my big um, message that I've been kind of pushing, I would say this year, the last few months, is that gun owners have to become part of the conversation. We have to stop stepping away from anything that is uncomfortable to us. When there, when there's a a meeting or like we recently, this was kind of interesting in Longmont. We had the city of Longmont and ten churches got together to do a gun violence discussion, which was they broke you up in, in teams and ma- made you talk about gun violence, right? And normally gun owners would like avoid that like the plague. Well, I did the opposite. I organized a ton of people to get in there and we actually ended up taking over the entire meeting, which was really cool. So my big, my big uh, message that I've got right now is quit, quit avoiding the conversation, become part of it because if we don't become part of it, then the other side is going to is going to be with one controlling the narrative. So Rally for Our Rights is just a, it's a great organization. We do everything from, you know, testifying out the Capitol to rallying in the streets to city councils to sanctuary stuff, um, education. We actually adopted a highway. We do open carry cleanups, which are super fun. And if people can get involved, we're on Facebook, we're on Twitter, we're on Instagram, YouTube, um, we're pretty much everywhere on social media. Our website is rallyforourrights.com. And there's tons of information there about what we do and how people can get involved. We're very Colorado-centric right now, but we are going nationwide. We've got seven states in the works as we speak. So really, really good stuff. It's been a lot of fun. I've just met some really incredible people, and I'm excited to as it keep, continues to grow. Very cool. That's so awesome. Keep up the great work. Uh, both of you guys, we truly, truly appreciate it. And to all of our listeners out there, we appreciate you guys too. Uh, if you would leave us a review, if you like us, if you don't like us, let me know and uh, see if I can help fix whatever you don't like about it. That would be truly appreciated. Uh, go to the Patriot Patch Company, patriotpatch.co. And don't forget to check out Second Call Defense uh, for any of your self-defense insurance needs. That's at firearmsradio.tv slash SCD. Get all the details there. Uh, thanks to everyone out there. I, I truly, truly appreciate it. And don't forget that This Week in Guns is produced by Kenny Ortega and is a production of the Firearms Radio Network. And I'll talk to you all next week.